I'm going to deal with a question that was put to us regarding the meaning of some words in the Bible. And you maybe want to turn there. It's a familiar passage in 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 through 17. 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 through 17. And the question is, what is the meaning of the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of of life. If you read from the American Standard Version, copyright 1901, the pride of life is rendered the vain glory of life. Vanity or that which is vain is empty or purposeless or no point to it at all. And when you understand the context in which these verses find themselves, then you understand even more so what the pride of life is, the vainglory of life is. But I was thinking when we sing that song that some of us have sung all our lives virtually, how shall the young secure their hearts? How shall anybody that will want to go to heaven secure his heart? And of course we concentrate on the young people because they're still formative. What does that mean? You're still setting up the course of life that's going to guide your disposition of heart, your attitude toward life, yourself, your parents, your own view of what it will be when you decide to become, if such is possible, a husband or a wife or parents. But, of course, none of that makes much difference. You know, all that's pointless if you don't become a Christian. Now, as an older person who's been a Christian quite a long time, I can tell you now that how can any of us secure our inward man, our spirits, our hearts, that once this old tabernacle of clay has finished its work and it's going back to the dust from whence it came, we, you, me, the real me, the real you, will continue on. The Bible says the spirit returns to God who gave it. Now we can get more specific as to where that spirit goes at death. We can talk about the resurrection and so on, but that's not the point. Uh, things change radically, more than our finite, limited human minds can grasp, except as it's revealed in the Word of God, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, concerning what it is to die. When uh, Lazarus, a friend of Jesus, Mary and Martha's brother, was raised from the dead by Jesus, there's no record at all that he had anything to bring back to us to tell us what it was like to go through the process of dying. And yet when you think of all of the people who have ever lived, they've all done it. And there's no reason to believe that we're going to escape it. But I think sometimes maybe some people who are so void of spiritual matters, of the Bible, of eternity, they get the idea that, well, they're trying to discover a vaccine for the this, that, or the other. If I can still be alive, I, I, I come up with something where I won't have to die. It doesn't surprise me that the people would deceive themselves in that way. But as I remarked to a lady in the rehab class the other day, it is appointed unto men once to die. And after that, the judgment, Hebrews 9, 27. No matter how much we walk on these treadmills, <laughs> it just won't make it different. It might make it a little better here. But as Paul also said, bodily exercise profiteth little. Little, yeah, it does. He's going to die. That's all there is to it. Now, how are we going to spend our lives here getting ready for eternity or not? Most won't. Some reason or another, people don't even like to think about being dead. Paul didn't have that view. Did you notice that? To depart and be with Christ is far better. Why shouldn't any member of the church, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, having lived according to 1 Corinthians 15, 58, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know your labor, here's that word vain, is not in vain, pointless or empty or worthless, in the Lord. Because it's in the Lord, Ephesians 1, 3, that he's located all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. So how am I able to secure my heart? Well, in answering the question... What is the meaning of the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life? We're going to see that's what John's up to. 
Because we have to know ourselves. <coughs> Knowing ourselves is not that easy. I'm pretty subjective toward myself. If I'm apt to be uh, biased, it's, it's apt to be for me. And uh, that's the reason we have to guard our hearts with all diligence. For out of it are the issues of life. Out of it are the issues of life. How, how you think is the way you act. If you're a bonehead, you'll do bonehead things. If you're uh, arrogant in heart, you'll be, you'll be arrogant toward everybody else. If you're interested in making money and that's all that matters or some station in life that's important to show how great you are, that comes from the heart. That comes from the disposition of mind. That comes from the mindset. That's the reason Jesus had so much to say about our hearts, our inward man, our mind. Look at the Beatitudes, the beautiful mindsets. They're completely different from the ways of the world. How do we secure a heart? Well, we can't be ignorant of Satan's devices, can we? Paul says they weren't. We're not ignorant of Satan's devices. And we learn that Satan is as a roaring lion who goeth about seeking whom he may devour. I would say Satan goes around all the time with a mouth full and a belly full. Uh, because that's what he does. But how does he do that? He can't do that if I know how to do what Paul also said. Resist the devil. And what will he do? He's a coward. He will flee from you. Not just walk away. He will flee from you. But then you have also draw near to God and he'll draw near to you. You show God you love him and you have faith in his word and you're living it, you'll get better in spiritual things. Not all spiritual things are just living like the Lord wants you to live. To be spiritual is to be obedient to God's will. That's all it is. There's no mystical boogie 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 floating about a foot above the ground and, and with some sort of halo above your head. It's simply rendering obedience to God's will because you love him and you know what life's all about. It's to get ready for eternity. That's all. Anything else should not get in our way. So answering the question, love not the world. Well, that gets interesting. Love not the world. That's very straightforward. Love not the world. Well, let's stop there a minute. Have we got a contradiction here? The same apostle wrote that Jesus said in John 3, verse 16. Anybody ever heard of that verse? They've never heard of another one? For God so loved the world. What? what, what? Apostle John, inspired by the same Holy Spirit, writing part of the same New Testament, says that God so loved the world. And now he tells me in a letter written to tell me how to go to heaven. Love, not the world. Well, for the thinking person, it doesn't take much thinking. It's quite obvious that world can have different meanings. It's sort of like in the King James Version where it says concerning the trying of Abraham's faith when he was commanded to offer up Isaac, God did tempt Abraham. Yet James comes along and says, God doesn't tempt anyone. What? Contradiction of the scriptures? No, it just simply means one, uh, God will try your confidence and trust in him based on his word. He'll put you to the test. On the other hand, he never solicits anybody to violate his will to sin. That's all it means. Part of that is simply right and divining the word of truth, 2 Timothy 2.15. So love not the world. He must mean something different than what Jesus or what is said by John in John 3.16. Notice he elaborates a little further. Love not the world. Don't love the world. What do you mean? Well, the, neither the things that are in the world. But God, in loving the world, meant he loved the people who were in sin. Christ died for the ungodly. While we were sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. He laid down his life for us when we were hating him, not caring about him, doing as we pleased. So what does he mean that are in the world? Well, he elaborates a little further. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Now, that's sort of like saying, if, you, if I lost you in those first few words, 
this will defeat your attention here because it means if you don't have what I'm talking about, if you don't reject what I'm telling you to reject, then you don't have the love of the Father in you. Well, I want the love of the Father in me. Now notice then what he says. For all that is in the world. What do you mean? I'm in the world. You're in the world. God loved me, gave his son to die for me. Jesus loved me. This I know, for the Bible tells me so. For all that's in the world, now he begins to delineate the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride or vain glory of life. Is not of the Father. Well, who made me the way I am? Well, God did. Well, how is it then that man gets himself into the mess he's in? All have sinned. That's the transgression of God's law. John says that in 1 John 3, 4. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And the wages of sin is death, Romans 6, 23. Did God make me to sin? Oh, that marvelous thing that can be good for us, but in most cases is our worst enemy. Our free will. I have the power of choice. And God in this life, in this fleshly body, says you can either love me, take me at my word and have faith in me, and be obedient to me, or you can live on the level of the flesh. You can live as if there is no day of reckoning. You can live as if there is no after that the judgment. As Paul said, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ to give account of the deeds done in the body, whether good or bad. You can live as though, no, I'm not accountable to anybody. Isn't that pretty much the attitude? Don't tell me what to do. I'm an American. I have rights, so when I walk up to Jesus, I'll say, get out of the way. I want to go to heaven. You're standing my way. Now you say, oh, I'd never say that. I don't think that. By the fruits you shall know them. <laughs> America is a wonderful place. Let me tell you, a place is far, far better. America never will measure up to it. It's the kingdom of God. It cannot be shaken. America can be shaken, more than likely in time. If it follows the history of all nations, it'll go down the drain somewhere or the other, or at least change radically. I, I can't do anything about all that except as I live a righteous life in the church, faithful to Him right now. The best thing anybody can do to keep America where we'd like for it to be is be a faithful member of the Church of Christ, a Christian. And you don't find Christians anywhere else. And I mean as Christians defined and used in the New Testament and as Church of Christ is used in the New Testament and defined. Now, people don't understand that this late date and they claim to be members of the Lord's Church. They need to go back and start learning the alphabet spiritually all over again and start with the sincere milk of the Word to understand how God saves a man and where the Lord added that saved person. He didn't put him in a human church. He didn't put him in some sort of fraternal organization. When a person from the heart obeyed that form of doctrine, and we could spend more time on that, Romans 16, 7, 6, 17, 18, he added him to his church because that's the only thing he bought with his blood. It's the only thing. We became citizens of the kingdom of heaven. John 3, 3 and 5. Translate, translated as Paul wrote it to Colossians, and Colossians 1, into the kingdom of his dear son. Everything else is secondary and subsidiary to me, and it has been all my life. And other things don't matter. Friendships included. Never let it be that way. I like people. I think I try to be nice toward people. That doesn't mean I'm let you run over me. <laughs> And if you'll read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you'll see that our Lord made it very clear that he drew the line as to where he would uh, bend and where he wouldn't. You know where that line is? Truth. Can't change the truth. Well, I'll give you this. I'll give you that. Well, somebody approached him one time doing that, didn't they? Fall down and worship me. <coughs> this, that, and the other. Jesus answered with the scripture every time. The only kingdom that really should be our concern is members of the church, first, foremost, and always, and then we'll be what we ought to be in whatever human kingdom we're in, is the kingdom of Christ. 
And yet I see people get completely overwhelmed by the affairs of this present world that are quickly passing away. And if it doesn't pass away before you do, you will pass away before it does. Whatever it is, you're going to leave all this behind. It's all going to be gone. The lust of the flesh is the carnal and impure desires and cravings of that biological part of our flesh. A desire, is, as he speaks of it here, of the flesh, is as God made this body to function in this physical world. Ultimately, this world and this body in it is made so that we can be on probation before God. But I live according to the flesh. Even to the breaking of God's will, not caring about God, not caring about His will, not caring about much of anything but me. The lust of the flesh seeks gratification of the flesh, not caring at all how God says. Whatever, it doesn't make any difference. And you see that all around us. You see it in the church. Where do you think these false doctrines on marriage, divorce, remarriage, and all sorts of things uh, came from except to justify living contrary to what the Bible teaches? Some of us are old enough to remember that when marriage, divorce, and remarriage issues weren't that big a deal in the church. Everybody pretty much followed the truth of Matthew 19, 6, Matthew 19, 9, Matthew 5, 32, and so on. But I can remember when it all, I was preaching when it all came to, to be a big to-do, and it's gone down from there. Well, I said back in those days, well, if we can get loose from what the Bible binds on us and His, in God's Word, that is, Concerning marriage, divorce, and remarriage, there's nothing to say that we won't do it on everything else. Okay? I said that back when I was in my 20s when all that mess started rearing its head in the Lord's church. I think it's proven true. Why? Because I was a prophet? No. Because the Bible tells me how man is. Evil seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. The point is being made there is what we say is once you start down that road, then you begin to apply what justified you to sin in this area and various other areas. And that's what happens. That's how you become worldly. That's how the flesh, the lust of the flesh gets gratified. And of course, people who live totally on that plane ignore the inward man, ignore the spiritual. They're hung up in the here and now. So that's all we're talking about. The innate desires in themselves are not sinful. God made us with those things. We need them to function properly in a material world. But they have to be regulated. And it's God that regulates them in His Word. He tells us how to live. He talks about self-control because we are free moral agents. You came this morning because you chose to come this morning. Period. There's not a soul here that would say... I came this morning against my will. Now, some child might say that sometimes. I remember an old brother. This was close to 50 years ago, if it wasn't. He was quite prominent in those days. He was speaking at the old Fried Harmon lectures. And he was telling about his son, who was adult at that time, had been preaching quite a while. Uh, the preacher was Brother J. Roy Vaughn. And he was a very elderly man, about 1971, 72. And he was telling about his son growing up in World War II and what a catastrophe. Uh, December 7th, 1941, Pearl Harbor, the Japanese bombing our fleet there and so forth. Of course, that was all the talk. We can't even now begin to realize for about a, six months at least, maybe even up to a year, uh, we didn't know what was going to happen in America. We didn't know whether the Japanese were going to be landing on the West Coast or not. Be that as it may, that's all talk, as you can imagine, from things you've lived through. But they were getting ready to go to services. And he was a little boy, his son was at that time. And he didn't want to go. And, of course, he'd been hearing all this stuff about the Japanese bombing Pearl Harbor, Japanese bombing Pearl Harbor, how terrible that was. And he swelled up like so many kids do and said, I just wish the Japanese had bombed that old church building. Well, that's childish, isn't it? A lot of adults, they might not say it that way. But by their actions, they pretty much indicate it. There's more than one way to bomb a church building. There's more than one way to bomb God's influence in your life. And one of those ways, of course, is the lust of the flesh. We've got to know what do we do with our bodies on earth? 
Think about that. How many people raise that simple question? What do I do with this body? Somebody else going to control it? Or my, is my lust of the flesh going to control it? Or is God going to control it? My appetites that are peculiar to this body in this world that are necessary, are they going to be regulated by my will submitting to God's will? Or am I just going to do as I please? Paul made this statement, no greater than Paul I, I've ever known. But he said this concerning himself. But I keep my body and bring it under subjection lest by any means when I have preached to others I myself should be a castaway 1 Corinthians 9.26 it's very easy for any one of us to tell somebody else from the Bible and show it to them right there here's what you need to do but remember the Pharisees Jesus said when they sit in Moses' seat when they're telling you exactly what the law of Moses said being that the Jew approached God under the law you do what they say but don't do as they do. In other words, they don't do like Paul said he did. Besides teaching the traditions that contradicted the law. But that's the attitude that ought to be in every one of us. 1 Corinthians 9.27 Unbridled coexistence cannot be when it comes to our being faithful to God at the same time. For if you live after the flesh, Paul wrote, you shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify, that means put to death, separate yourself from the deeds of the body, you shall live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Romans chapter 8, verses 13 and 14. Ephesians six seventeen says, The sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. Thus the Spirit leads us as we follow the sword of the Spirit, the instrument the Spirit uses to convict us of sin, convert us to Christ, and to keep us faithful in His church. Now the Word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even the dividing sunder of the soul and spirit and the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So we have set forth the purpose of life. For he that soweth to the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption, but he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. Galatians 6, verse 8. An overworked phrase is we've got to get our priorities right. Well, it still says, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. So, John is saying here to overcome the world, then you have to love not the world. And he tells us that first prong, what he means when he says the lust of the flesh. Then he talks about the lust of the eyes. The lust of the eyes. What does that mean? It's an inordinate, unlawful, as I said unbridled a while ago, inordinate, unlawful desire for fineries, Often seen in the houses that we long for, our clothing, even the furniture we have, our jewelry, real estate, automobiles, other material matters, which within themselves in many cases are not necessarily sinful. Wow, well, they become sinful. That's where your interest is. And that interest is so intense the Lord's kingdom gets somewhere over here in second place. The covetous longing for the tinsel and glitter of material things is there to haunt us. How shall the young secure their heart? Learn about that. How shall the older ones who secured their hearts keep their hearts secure? Keep it in mind and let it guide their lives. Americans have long been you know, pay on the credit plan. People burden themselves down with everything under the sun to say, look what I look like and look what I appear to be. You know, have you ever noticed a whole lot of America has to do, and it's not just America, but that's this is where we live, has to do with how I appear. Now, some of that can be real good. 
If you're talking about modesty, which is a biblical principle, I want you to be modest, and that puts forth a good appearance. But that's not what I'm talking about, and you know that. I'm talking about what appears to the worldly mind. Ooh. You ever notice how many people have cell phones? Well, we all do now. But that's a status symbol. You know that? You get on food stamps, you still got a cell phone. Or look at the cars we drive. I'm speaking in generalities, of course. We substitute the eternal for the worthless trash of this world. Any of these things can be used to the benefit of the kingdom. For the benefit of the kingdom. For the benefit of me knowing more of the Bible and how to live with the Lord in the kingdom. This is Philippians 2 and verse 4. Look not every man on his own thing, but every man also on the things of others. Now that's part of teaching me how to think like Christ and do like Christ and to be faithful to the kingdom. Well, you watch most people, and it's a battle to keep our hearts secure all our lives. And it's, I've said it here in this pulpit and many other places. I like it being done my way. Now that's all right to an extent. But people will tear up all sorts of things and make their own lives misery and give themselves emotional and mental fits because they're trying to make this world mold around themselves. And, and it won't work, folks. It just will not work. Concern for that which belongs to our brother will destroy or help destroy avarice and greed. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 18, while we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. How do you see what you can't see? Well, we always talk about it by the eye of faith. The revelation of God's Word gives me insight, gives me a view, allows me to see what the person ignorant of God's Word can't see, and the person dedicated to gratifying the appetites of flesh will not see. We overcome the lust of the eyes when our hearts are centered on that which God has promised. Going to heaven ought to be more important than anything else. Nothing else matters. And how shall the young secure their heart? Make that your pattern of life. Hebrews 11.10, writing to Jews who were Christians, but they were considering due to persecution to leave the faith. I want to use two scriptures. Peter addressed, he was the apostle to the Jews, as Paul was the apostle to the Gentiles, those same people when he said, nevertheless we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. You know, I can't even conceive of people in this world living exactly like God wants them to live. Everybody, every single solitary person living as the Bible says, that's their goal, they, they're interested in nothing else but living. Like, can you conceive of that? I can I think it's wonderful. But then listen to what is said to the Hebrews. The eyes, that is the Christians, eyes of faith, that is through the knowledge of God's word, the eyes of faith look for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Hebrews 11.10. Everybody knows that's Washington, D.C. Everybody knows that's Austin. Everybody knows it's a physical government. I'm interested in the kingdom that cannot be shaken. I'm interested in the New Testament. You know, listen, I'll tell you a secret. The New Testament outdoes the Constitution of the United States because it tells me how to live under whatever government I live and get along. See, we're interested in what's happening right here. What about our brethren in England or Russia or India? 
They can't be Christians and still honor their government. After all, the New Testament was written in a situation, as far as governments are concerned, of imperial Rome. It was telling them how to be faithful to God 2,000 years ago. So we're interested in not letting the glitter and the whatever and the transient things of this world captivate us and hold us, and that's how we spend our lives. The last of the pride of life, the vainglory of life, the pointlessness of life is demonstrated in, in this selfish desire for riches, for prestige, for station, for what the world honors, for titles, worldly acclaim. What the world considers to be great achievements and possessions. And all too often we in the church measure what's great in the same way. The Lord knew we'd do that. Because he said, he who would be greatest among you, let him be your servant. And then he showed them how to do that. He took what was normally the slave's job, a menial task in those days, and he washed their feet. Remember Peter's attitude? You're not going to wash my feet. You're the king. You're the Messiah. You're not going to wash my feet. Jesus, and it always is amazing, had a way of putting things straight in a matter of two or three words, a few words anyway. He said, if I don't wash your feet, you have no part in a lot with me. Then Peter ran the other direction, which is also typical of us. Oh, Lord, not my feet only, wash all of me. And Jesus responded by saying, no, just wash what's necessary, your feet. <laughs> simple. Oh, that's so simple. I could, I could even understand that. But he that would be greatest among you, let him be your servant. The passion of power and riches and high office in this world is in opposition to the very spirit of Christ. Listen to how Paul addressed the church in Philippi. Philippians 2 Verses 5 through 8. Let this mind be in you. Let, it has the force of a commandment. I've got to do it. It's imperative. It's what's necessary to keeping my heart. Let this mind be in you. Which was also in Christ Jesus. Who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, which means a thing to be grasped and held on to. I don't want to go, but I guess I'll have to. And as he left heaven, you can see his fingernails scraping on the walls and trying to hold back and not go. No. That's just what he did because it was necessary for the human race because my soul's that important and that shakes me up. That's how important my soul is, that the Creator would become like me and come into the world I made a mess of and live in it and overcome it and it was his own world. If you ever built something, it doesn't make any difference what it is, and it had somebody else mess it up, how do you feel about that? But the Lord did something like that. Without him, it was not anything made that was made. What did man do? Made in the very image of God. What did man do? He messed it up. The Lord says, I'll go into the world. You messed up, even when you don't care for me and you hate me. And I will come there and show you how God would live as a man. So he was tempted in every point like as we are yet without sin. Thus he's the Lamb of God that could go to the cross and die on our behalf. And even as Satan thought he was winning, when he killed him, he was simply going through the process that would allow for our forgiveness of sins. He made himself of no reputation, but took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of man. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient. A oh, bad word. That's not politically correct. Unto death, even the death of the cross. Now, what was the ultimate outcome of that? And it wasn't in his life. It was in the resurrection. Wherefore, in the light of these facts and the way he lived, God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. 
And then he concludes this as he applies it to the Philippians and to all of us. Wherefore, my beloved, as you've always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. Look at where he's headed with this. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Is there a message in that for us today? Is that up to date? To use an overworked word, is that relevant? Yeah, we will be to the end of time. It goes on a million years of the future. Indeed so. Take heed and beware of covetousness. For a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesses. Luke 12, 15. So our Lord said, The vainglory or the pride of life has nothing to offer of enduring value. It concerns the temporal, the here and now, the fleshly, the material, the physical. That's all passing away. Jesus asked, What shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Mark 8, 36. Now, therefore, what sh for what should we strive that we put all our energy into it? Well, here's how Paul said to Timothy that he needed to know himself and need to preach to the brethren. Charge them that are rich in this present world. Yeah, there's one to come. We're in the present world. That they be not high-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God, who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. How we need to learn these lessons if we would guard our hearts and secure them, whether young or old. You know, there are, again, younger folks who need to obey the gospel, older folks who may need to rededicate their lives to what they had in mind when they obeyed the gospel. But in our text, the Apostle John was showing that worldly lusts and passions are not of God. They're of this present world. And we can either let God through his word by study of it and by our willingness to submit to his will control us and the gratifying of those things and the rejecting of what needs to be rejected or we can live on the basis of this present world. But know this for sure. The affairs of this present world are quickly passing away. There's nothing new to the way Satan approaches us to get us to violate God's will and to get us to remain in sin. If you go all the way back to the beginning, look at Genesis 3, 6, of the way Satan got Eve to be deceived and violate his will. And when the woman saw the tree was good for food. What is that, lust of the flesh? Lust of the flesh is all that is. And was pleasant to the eyes. There's the lust of the eyes. And a tree desired to make one wise. <coughs> Fang glory of life. Pride of life. She took the fruit thereof. Did eat. She believed and obeyed a lie because her fleshly appetites led her to do that. That's what she wanted. She desired it. Genesis 3, 6. I won't read this now, but if you go over to the temptation of Christ, such as in Luke 4, 3 through 11, same approach. Same approach. Thousands of years later, that's the same approach he took to Jesus. Jesus overcame it because he knew the word. It is written. So when we don't know the truth and we're not interested in the truth, and we don't care about serving God, then we'll be involved, no ifs, ands, or buts about it, in gratifying the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, pride of life, which is not of the Father, but is of the world, and the world passes away, and the lusts thereof. I want you to think about this. Every appetite and desire that you have of this life because you're human in the flesh, It's all going to pass away someday. When you leave this life and you step outside of the physical realm of being a human, that's all gone. 
Now, what it will be like outside of the material, physical realm, I don't know. I know that it will be so radical, and I've used this at other times, that there will be no giving or taking in marriage. For we'll be as the angels. And John says we don't know what we'll be like, but we will be like him. Oh, what a radical. It's beyond my mind to grasp, and I think not just me, but everybody. So why spend our wills on a few years here living to gratify that which is peculiar to here to the exclusion of God's will? And if we're to grow in Christ and secure our hearts, or if you're thinking about becoming a Christian, this is what it'll mean to convert from that disposition of mind to the one that says God and His will be done. This kind of disposition will always need to be there. If you need to obey the gospel, now's the time to do it. You must believe in Christ, repent of your sins, confess your faith in Christ, and be baptized into Him for the remission of sins. If you're a child of God and you've gone back into the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, the pride of life, it slipped up on you, and that's where you spend most of your time now. You need to repent of that. Specific sins are the general wrong attitude and pray God for forgiveness once again rise up remembering you're a new creature in Christ and serve him faithfully till time is no more if you need to obey the gospel we invite you to come while we stand and while we sing